if you ever need a job as my new business development option lead, let me know. <laughs> Take this one. Good morning, and, and, and thanks for having me. Um, it, it is a privilege to, to be here, and it is great to see the sector <clears throat> coming together today um, to talk about race, which is not something that is easy to talk about. I'm going to speak in three sections today. Um, the first section, as the accent may give away, being an American, I'm going to talk about myself. That's what I know best. Um, the second section, a little bit about where I came from, because that's all connected. And then the third part is really about what I just have called lessons from the battlefield. And I, I, I will come back to where those lessons have, have, have come from. Um, but a little bit about my, 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 myself. Um, I was born in the US. I was born in a place called Jackson, Mississippi. Um, it is not a place that I would recommend anyone be born in. Um, Jackson, Mississippi, um, then and now, um, has the lowest um, average reading score in America. It has the lowest gross domestic product in the states um, in America. It is the hotbed of segregation and racism in America. It was the home of um, the white knights of the KKK. And one of its famous stories, among many, is that it's also the, the, the home of where Emmett Till was killed. And if you don't know the story, Emmett Till was a 14-year-old black boy who was killed because someone said he flirted with a white woman. His body was thrown in the river, scarred, and um, those people have never been brought to justice. If you're ever in Washington, D.C., I, I would encourage you to go to the African American Center there. Amongst as many things, as cast is there and, and the story. Um, my father and mother were born in Mississippi um, during the segregated times in Mississippi where there were colored only signs and fountains. Um, he picked cotton as a boy. And during World War II, um, he was among the first black Marines uh, recruited. They were not allowed to, to um, train with white Marines because of segregation. Um, but he had been sent to the Pacific uh, with many of the other black Marines uh, preparing for an invasion of Japan, <clears throat> where he would have met certain death. Clearly, um, the U.S. chose a plan B, and so that invasion never took place. From there, you would think, okay, well, that, that's, that's pretty bad. Well, we then moved north to the South Bronx, um, and that truly is going from the frying pan to the fire. Um, the South Bronx, at the time I was there, it led the U.S. in, no, I say led, it is number one, not just in one category, it was number one in murder, South Bronx was number one in rape, South Bronx was number one in robbery, South Bronx was number one in aggregated assault, and 40% of the South Bronx was either burned down or abandoned. That was the step up um, for us. As, as, as a black man in the South Bronx at age 21, you were more likely to be in jail or dead than to have a college degree. My mother, um, probably like many parents, decided, you know, you're gonna study piano. I'm like, eh, okay. Um, and so I studied piano. And after a while I realized, piano's not giving me a lot of street credit in the South Bronx. <laughs> um, you know, you know, Beethoven and Mozart isn't really resonating with my crew. So I switched to trumpet and um, kind of excelled in that. And it's a very selective school, you audition, um, but at the time I, I auditioned and got selected into what is formally known as the High School of Music and Art. Um, what you may know it as is the Fame movie. Um, now I can't stand on the table and put my leg up, <clears throat> but it's, it, it's a very um, famous school for music and the arts there, um, with alumni such as Al Pacino and Lise Minnelli. Um, I was a semi-professional trumpet player, but as every frustrated trumpet player does, I went into business and, and, and ultimately HR. The first story, though, I wanted to tell is that music and art, and, 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 and it was a lesson that I didn't really realize I had learned until probably about 20 years ago. I came from a very clearly deprived um, background. Many, I was the only black trumpet player in the section. Many of the other trumpet players, once I got there, I realized 
they actually had different mouthpieces. I don't know if any of you played your house instruments, but you know, I had a 6C um, mouthpiece, and they had two or three different mouthpieces, depending on what they were going to play. And clearly, you know, my trumpet was from the pawn shop, it was probably about $25, and, and they had very high-end Yamaha instruments, six, seven hundred dollars plus, even back then. Um, so I, I, I wasn't on an even level um, field. We were allowed to have um, a tutorial each week, 30 minutes tutorial with the music teacher. My music teacher gave me 90 minutes because he realized I had not had class, I had not been classically trained. I didn't have the lessons that they had. I didn't even have the right tools that they had. And so for everyone else in the brass section, they got 30 minutes of, of, of lessons. I got 90 minutes of lessons. And it wasn't until I really reflected on that that I realized that's the first example of equity versus equality. Equality would have been me getting 30 minutes just like everyone else. Equity turned out to be me getting 90 minutes to help me to level that playing field, to give me the extra um, tutorials and, and, and things I needed. And from there, I'll fast um, wind the story. I came to the UK about 20 so years ago. Um, came and worked with BT as the head of HR strategy. Um, here's where the bragging starts from this point on. Um, at BT, I was the only HR person to ever win the Chairman's Award for Excellence, and I still have been the only person to win the Chairman's Award for Excellence at BT. I then spent about five years with Shell in the Netherlands as the Global HR Director for Exploration. And then I came back, and I've been the Chief People Officer for Transport for London, TFL. If you want to buy me a drink sometime, I'll talk about that one. Um, but I've also been the Chief People Officer for um, a company called Mises, which is now called Finestra, which is a fintech company. Um, and I've also been the Chief People Officer for Scottish and Newcastle, which is a beer and beverage company. Both those companies got taken over. So I'm not jaw hopping. Um, although Scottish and Newcastle is the one that I say got away. Had a nice office up in Edinburgh, had a fridge of Newcastle Brown Ale that my office, and a membership to the Whiskey Club right down on uh, Princess Street, but I, 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 I digress. I still have from Mises and Scottish Newcastle the dubious distinction of being the only black male chief people officer for a Pussy 100 company. There's never been a chief black male chief people officer before me, and I left the corporate role about eight years ago, and there hasn't been one since. That's another drink. <clears throat> That's probably a statement more about UK PLC than myself. And where are you um, Karis is a consulting firm. We work with companies around the issue of leadership and culture and inclusion. Um, we work with companies like Stanser um, and, and, and others that are, that are committed to the inclusion journey. And I'll talk a little bit more about the inclusion journey. Um, and basically, companies that realize you can't check your own homework, particularly if it's an essay question. Um, and, and so you know, they bring us in to help them, which they say is the most valuable thing, was their people and their culture. Our client list runs the gamut. Um, we believe we have one of the best client lists in the business. It's a client list that we think any McKinsey partner would be proud to have. It runs the gamut, and we're a pure consulting firm. We don't sell workshops, we don't sell algorithms, we don't sell head hunting. Um, if you take the five broadcasters, we would count all four, um, four of the five as, as, as clients in the pharmaceutical industry, the largest pharmaceutical company, Roche, current client as we speak, but also Pfizer and Santa Fe. Take the music business. Um, three major music companies would account Universal and Warner um, as clients, Universal being the largest and a current client. And then it branches out from Scanscur to Network Rail to Royal Mail to Deliveroo to UBS um, in the banking sector, Hogan Lobos in the law firm sector, and a host of others beyond that. Why I say that is because from this point on, my lessons from the battlefield is not from a book. It's not academic. It is from my experiences um, leading and working with major executives and their teams and their staff. It's from my experiences as a chief people officer. 
We have probably spoke to more black and Asian staff than anyone else in the UK, because when we do our work, we are face to face with them, talking about their lived experiences. It's not a workshop, it's a very structured conversation about their experiences and the workplace. And we're also speaking with the leaders. And so, if you're looking to be inspired today, sorry. If you're looking to leave here feeling good about the things you're doing, sorry. Um, this is really the truth as I know it and as I see it. So what's the first lesson I've learned from the battlefield that's important here? And it's one that will seem rather strange to you, but just about in all our companies that we work with, we find that the leadership of the organization conflates or confuses diversity and inclusion. We find many times when we ask an organization about inclusion, they give us a diversity answer. So we'll say, what have you done to make your organization more inclusive? They'll say, well, we got a supply chain target. We have, um, we have an employee resource group. We've recruited more women. We've increased our black leaders from one to two. Um, you know, we've we, we increased the, our, our, our women from 30% to, to 40%, and that's what we've done. I'm like, no, 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 that's diversity. That's the quantitative side. Give me the qualitative side. And I guarantee you, most leaders, um, I won't say in this room, but most leaders will struggle to tell you what exactly they've done as leaders to change the fundamental way they organize, they work, they lead, they promote, they recruit their staff. So here's a short thing to think about, because the reality is, in, in, in many companies, um, the, the pyramid is up here. Most decisions are made at the pyramid. Most diverse and unrepresented employees, if you wish, tend to be towards the bottom of the pyramid. So here you go, the decisions are up here, we recruit all these good people, they're down here, all's good, we're inclusive. <laughs> well, first thing I say is, for anybody who's in finance, the first thing I would tell you is, you've left money on the table. You have not gotten your return on investment. You have not unlocked the potential, the value of diversity. Inclusion is unlocking the value of diversity. But the other thing about inclusion is that it's transformational. It's not an incremental thing. It's not about someone saying, well, yeah, I asked the quiet person in the room to speak louder in the meetings. Good, that's great. I want Hamilton quote, but what about in the room where it happens? Who's in the room where it happens? Inclusion is a transformational issue in the organization. So here's another thing to think about. Pyramid decisions are up here, underrepresented staff are down there. What happens? Hierarchy, if you work in a hierarchical environment, and dare say the construction industry tends to be hierarchical, um, and then it has its own hierarchies within hierarchies. There's the site managers and then there's the human resource people. Yeah? But, um, but if you work in a hierarchical fashion, you already have lost the battle on inclusion. Because you're making decisions up here, you recruited this talent down there, and you're not tapping into it. So what has been amazing to me is that many companies actually don't understand the fundamental changes as a leader that's required to be inclusive, the fundamental changes in how you go about running your organization to be inclusive. Don't confuse diversity with inclusion. Inclusion is not a field of dreams. It is not building diversity, and they will come. And this is what I've heard many times, is that the leaders believe, well, I have a diverse leadership team now, so I must be inclusive. Wrong. Fundamental lesson, big surprise for me, um, is that so many people confuse the two and they will speak to one assuming that it implies the other. Diversity is not inclusion. What's the other lesson from the left battlefield? The belief that success in gender representation is a basis and a platform for success in race inclusion and diversity. Well, that's wrong too. Um, so why, why is that wrong? 
Well, let's start with, with, with the issue of gender. And typically, we're talking about white women. Nothing personal. Um, I'm married to a white woman. Um, so, um, nothing personal there. So, the, 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 the challenge there is that this is a penetrating glimpse at the obvious, I admit. But the challenge there is I tell every CEO and C-suite executive I meet, every senior executive white man knows a white woman. Every senior executive white man knows a white woman. Raise your hand if you don't. Um, mother, sister, aunt, whatever. And so what you find is that white women are typically part of the professional orbit of senior executives, and clearly they're part of the personal orbit of senior executives. Black people tend not to be part of the professional orbit of most senior executives, and even less so in their personal orbit. And so that distance creates unfamiliarity, it creates discomfort, it creates stereotyping, it's a lived experience of all the protective characteristics out there. The only one that a white male cannot be is black. As a white male, you can be every one of the other protective characteristics. The one you can't be is black. And so it, it is a foreign, distant thing that creates a, 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 a discomfort. And so what we find is that conversation around race is very difficult because it's just not part of their DNA. And on top of that is the issue that it's not a monolithic um, thing. So the lived experiences of black people is not monolithic. If you're raised in Nigeria, a predominantly, predominantly black society, and you lived in that environment and you come to the UK, that's a different experience from someone who's been brought up in Sheffield or in Cumbria, um, where a white-dominated um, environment and what they've been brought up in. It's not the same. Asians are not the same. Sikh, Hindu, Muslim, Catholics. And so I find that you know, it, it, it's a false positive, as the science would call it. It's a false positive to assume that you can translate and extrapolate what you've done in gender, which tends to be around benefits and policies, um, typically, into race, it will not work. Here's the other lesson I learned in the battlefield. Half of the money you spend on DNI will be wasted. Half of the money you spend on DNI will be wasted. The key is knowing which half. And so, Here's a couple of things to think about in terms of what's the half that might be of value. So the first question I would say, is that money being spent on something that's informative or is it being spent on something that's transformative? If it's being spent on something informative, unconscious bias training unto itself, yeah, that's probably the half that's probably being wasted. It's being spent on programs that involve the leadership and the behavior and the structure, you're probably in the right direction. Is it off the shelf? Is it cut and paste? That's probably the half that's being wasted. Is it specific and contextual to your particular organization? Yeah, you might be leaning towards the, um, the value part. Is your leadership involved? Many times what you find is the leadership signs off, says okay, Go do it, Jackie. Now, that's the gender right. I'm not talking about scans here, of course. Um, unless the leadership are involved in that journey, they are personally and intimately involved in that journey, it's probably part of the half that's being wasted. The other thing I would say is there's a lot of focus on intent and not impact. Every organization I go to, and I've sat with the CEO, we're doing all this. We got employee resource groups. You know, I, I, I've been to town halls and, and, and we've talked about this. And, you know, I've, I've given money for training. I don't understand what the issue is. And that's because it's that, it's that intent versus impact. We're not really looking at that impact. And for you engineers there who know better than I, you know, it's a single to noise ratio issue. The single to noise in DNI is, is, is the challenge. You say it up here, you just assume it's happening 
down there. And what I find is that most organizations are not looking at the impact. They're just saying, we've got recruiting, we've got blind CVs, we've got diverse recruitment panels, and I can tell you why all those won't work. Um, what else do you want from us? We're doing the intent part. You really need to look at the impact. When I was at MISIS, um, I had to go get an employee physical. It was legal in those days. And the doctor was in Hans Place. Hans Place is right down from Harrods, probably right across from the Equatorian Embassy, where um, the man was being held. And suffice to say, high priced territory, high priced doctor. I went there early um, because I wanted to get back to work to get my pre employment physical. You know, I got the clipboard, said, wait took about 15 pounds off of that, <laughs> and um, said, you know, how much do you drink? I'm like, what? Okay, can't tell the truth on that either. So lied on that, and even then the doctor said, Jesus, that's how much you drink? He <laughs> only knew. But um, gave it back to the receptionist. It was early. I was the only one in the reception area. Doctor walks in with this clipboard, my papers on there, and I stop and say, I know this routine. I've seen this in Houston. I've seen this in Memphis. I've seen this in New York. I've seen this in LA. All the equivalents. I know this routine. He looks at it. He looks around the room. I'm the only one in the room reading Country and Home magazine. Um, and he walks back out. I know the routine. And while I wasn't there, um, it, Am I shrinking? I've heard of really small. Always so, <laughs> so I went there, the door closes, he goes out to receptionist. I didn't hear the conversation, but I'll bet you my mortgage. I know what the conversation is. He goes to the receptionist and says, where's Mr. Douglas? At first, I'm thinking, that guy is much too small before he's put down here. Um, too big, he's put down here. And I'm sure the receptionist says, that's Mr. Douglas. And he comes in and we finish. A lesson there, what I learned is, you know, it transposes into the corporate sector, is that for that doctor, I was not his archetype of a patient. He's dealing with C-suite executives. I'm an executive vice president. He just looks an executive vice president, FTSE company, pre-employment physical. He had his archetype of who his patients are. What I've realized is that every organization also has an archetype of a leader. Where they've come from, what background they've had. I mean, we work with one company where the leadership lives in Chiswick. Don't ask me why, but they, they live in Chiswick. And so that's their archetype. They dress a certain way. In my music company, there's a certain level of trainers. If they cost less than 300 pounds, you're not really with it. Um, so there's a dress code, there's unwritten rules. I remember my days at Shell. You'll never see this written on a piece of paper in Shell, and Shell during that period probably had one of the gold-plated talent management, Harvard Business School talent management programs. But the one thing you'll never see on a Shell talent management program, which is part of, but it's part of their archetype, if you look at the background of the senior leaders at Shell, you'll find something common among all of them. Other than the Dutch being told, you will find that they all have worked outside of their country of birth. Every Shell executive, even probably now, has worked outside of their country of birth. And if in the upstream side and exploration, they've also either worked in Nigeria, Brunei, or Oman. Not written anywhere, nowhere, but it's part of their archetype of what they think a leader is. So in your own organization, when you go back and you're thinking about diversity, even more so you're thinking about inclusion, thinking about progression, you need to also think about, do we have an archetype that that person from a different background is going to be able to aspire to? Skiing. How many times have we gone into a company and people say, all the leaders do is sit there and talk about skiing or the new restaurant 
or even cheese. I haven't gotten ahead of on the cheese thing. <laughs> That's um, <laughs> quite a bit. Um, and, 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 and just how it disengages people with a different lived experience in terms of those conversations. Don't, they don't think about it, but it's part of their archetype is that if you share those commonalities with me, those experiences, you're with me, you're, you're, you're part of the club. So I find when I'm talking to senior leaders, the DNI thing still is kind of a tough thing for them to really get their arms around. Because they still think of my day job, and then there's this DNI stuff, and how do I bring the two together? So I'm going to give you three things that I have found is on every CEO's and senior executive's mind. And I guarantee, if you're serious about diversity and inclusion, you can plug it into and become the reason why you're doing it if you can't find any other reason. There's three things every CEO is focused on. The first thing the CEO is focused on is value creation. Every CEO is focused on value creation, and clearly, if they're a traded company, it's almost their number one driver because their bonus is probably based on that in, in many ways. We don't have to go through it now, but I guarantee you, you can look at diversity and inclusion from a value creation point of view. Harvard has said it, you know, McKinsey has said it. Yeah, I still don't understand why CEOs don't believe the data. The data is out there that you're 35% more likely to outperform your competitors if you have a racially and gender diverse population. You're 21% to have higher IBITAR if you have a diverse population. You're 30% more likely to exceed in your customer satisfaction ratings if you have a diverse population. Why don't they believe the data? Value creation drives, diversity and inclusion drives value creation. Okay, that doesn't work for you. How about organizational blind spots? The second thing that every CEO is focused on, and that's what strategy is about. What are those things around the horizon that we're not seeing? Clearly, diversity and underrepresentation drives and helps you understand those organizational blind spots. And the last I will call alpha performance, and that's typically for public trading companies. When you deal with the analysts and the city, what they want to know is, are you outperforming your competitors? I would gather that no one here has KPIs or objectives that says, just be average next year. We're good with that. <laughs> just be average, you know? You know, Scanser, just be average. Mott, just be average. HS2, just, just, just deliver almost on time, you know? Um, no. What every company strives for is to outperform and get a disproportionate share of whatever market they're in. And clearly, an argument made that diversity and inclusion is about that. All of that is underpinned by psychological safety. And again, because I'm trying to keep the time, I'll just leave that there. So the final thing I would say about um, diversity and inclusion is the focus on the race agenda. Because here's the other thing I find in the lessons from the battlefield, is that CEOs say, well, if I just focus on race, what about all the other identities and, and things that I have to deal with? Well, here's one that should be close to your heart. I call it, think of it as the curb cut effect. Familiar with the curb cut effect? You, know, you, you cut the, 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 the curb, um, designed for, for disabilities. But so doing, by cutting the curb, you've also made those sidewalks easier for people with pushing strollers, trams, you made it easier for people elderly with walkers or those rolling a bag behind them. Focusing on race and coming up with solutions around race uplifts the whole organization. If you find a blind spot that you have in dealing with race, believe me, if, if you've solved that one, you've solved the whole host of things. And so it's not about one identity, but dealing with race has a curb cut effect, is what I've found. And so don't be afraid to focus on that one thing. Last two things before I, um, I wrap up. You all have safety as your number one thing. Lack of fall protections and proper labeling, unsafe scaffolding, fail to use proper respiratory protection, forklift safety rule violations, you name it. You would all understand and recognize that's an unsafe practice and within your safety culture, you call it out. 
You do not want to cause any physical harm with your employees. How about I, I said, here's another five safety issues that you need to be focused on. Mistaking one black person for another, asking to touch a black person's hair, asking where are you from, saying we focus on talent, not diversity, i.e. it's a zero sum game, you can't have both. You're doing a great job, I mean, your gym was a better fit. Oh, you didn't sound black over the phone. That's interesting. Um, how about if they were the same sort of challenges for safety as forklifts were, as, 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 as scaffolding, hard hats, steel toe shoes? Well, they are. And so the challenge to you, I say, is to treat physical safety in the same way as you would treat mental and emotional safety. That plays into your DNA, you know, easily. Mental and emotional safety should have the same priority and the same psychological safety as physical safety. At Shell, if someone saw an unsafe practice out in the North Sea on the rig, they can shut down the rig. You should have an environment where if someone sees an unsafe physical or emotional practice, they can call it out and will be addressed. Treat mental and emotional safety the same way you do physical safety. So I'm going to end now because I've run a little over. And so I was thinking, you know, because I don't believe a pair of speeches that far in advance. Actually, this did this one a day in advance, probably shows. Um, but um, I was thinking, you know, how, how do I end this? And, and Universal is a very valued customer. And I, I was having this conversation um, yesterday morning. I said, I've got to end the conference with something. And I said, well, tell your Marvin Gaye story, um, which I told them. It was like Universal pitching for the work. I said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll see about that, but yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do that. So Marvin Gage, you know, one of the great soul singers of, of Zero, a Motown label, which is owned by Universal. I bring it up here. Holland Dozier was one of the great um, writing teams of the era, a great song from Diana Ross, Temptations. Everyone in Motown has a Holland and, and Dozier song. And they wrote songs for Marvin Gaye, What's Going On, um, being one, one of the most um, iconic what they did with, with, with Marvin Gaye was um, they would write the songs about a half octave to octave higher because they wanted to get him out of his comfort zone and really push him in terms of an artist because he kind of had a low rapsy voice. He wanted to be kind of sexy and things. Um, and so they wrote a little higher for him, trying to force him to get out of his comfort zone. And so my, my, my message to you is, is the same when it comes to inclusion and diversity. Sing an octave higher. Sing a octave higher in what you're trying to do. It's uncomfortable. You may not think you can do it, but try it. Get out of the comfort zone. Challenge the underlying assumptions of the way things are. And try singing that octave higher. Thank you. So much, Frank. Um, Frank wanted to have one or two questions quickly. I know we're running a bit out of time, but Laura's got the mic. So is anyone brave enough to put your hand up for a question? There we have one over there. Hi. Just with reference to your experience as a, as a black executive in the UK, what advice would you be giving to? your clients, uh, people like myself, people that want, that want to aspire or aspire to access that C-suite level? The idea uh, yeah, that I, I don't have civil bullets for anything, um, but I, I think the first thing is, I think you need to be authentic and true to yourself. What I find in many organizations, and it's many, and many times it's the organization's problem, but we end up being part of it, is that we as black people, we find it more comfortable to assimilate into that culture. And so we leave our heritage behind, and again, I'm, I'm speaking from the battlefield, we leave our heritage behind. If there's certain foods we would eat at home, 
we don't bring those to work. We don't want someone to ask us about it. We don't want to tell a whole story about why I'm you know, eating lunch. I just want to eat my lunch. So I say the first thing is, is, is to be authentic. And then the other thing is I think you have to try to find those project or experiences that create visibility for you. So it's not just your day job, but you have to make a proactive effort to try to get out there and find out what projects, who can I work with, that's going to give me some more visibility than I have right now. And the last thing I, I think is, is key, black or white, is you know sponsors are still you know the key to most people's success. Um, is that you have to find someone who's going to sponsor you. But I go back to the second one: the experiences are key, and because the difference in, in progression in many companies is who got the chance to have the experiences, who got the chance to have the expat assignment in Oman or Brunei versus who didn't. That becomes a determinant. So getting that experience. Um, it's very key. That's the short answer. Thank you. Hi, uh, Frank. Uh, thanks very much for the speech. Um, I just wanted to ask, you spoke about um, decision makers having intent uh, versus them having an impact. Um, what practical examples uh, do you know of where their decisions have made more of an impact rather than just uh, an intent? They're, where they have made an impact is where they are the drivers. It's not HR, it's not the head of d &I, it's where they are driving the conversation. And it's not just where they're driving, it's where their whole leadership team is driving the conversations. It's not just the CEO. You know where you're someplace where you, you go there and all of a sudden you find the CFO or the MD of the big battalion talking about diversity and inclusion. When it gets to that level of conversation at the C-suite, you're probably in a better place and it's just coming from the CEO or HR director. So it's where they believe that is important to their strategy, they believe it's important to their strategic um, imperatives and gives them competitive advantage, they embed it in everything they do. And so I, I would say not, not that he is the best case example, but if you look at J, Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan Chase, you look at anything Jamie's doing, Jamie always comes back to diversity and inclusion, and his team always comes back to diversity and inclusion, because they have embedded it into their day job, as opposed to something I do in my spare time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Frank. Let's give